Hello, explorers on this particularly snowy day in February. I hope you are all having a good day and a good afternoon that you are staying home, staying safe. And while we are all making sure we stay home, stay safe, and that, you know, maybe once we get a few things done, go out and play in the snow a little bit. While we're doing that, I figured today would be a good day to um, jump into a little bit of poetry. Um, it's been a little while since we've done anything with some poetry, and it's always good to review. Um, so today, the poem I have picked out for us today is uh, Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. And this is um, one of my personal favorite uh, poems from Edgar Allan Poe, not because it's not because it's genre defining, not because it defines Poe as a poet or as a writer, but because there's something about this poem that just, it kind of boogies, it dances, and it's just got this nice musical quality to it. And it's really easy to get pulled into. And so I'm going to actually go ahead and I'm going to read this first. Um, so that way we can, uh, we can all sample this poem together. And then um, after that, we'll kind of go in and we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit. Um, we won't dig too deep, um, at least not today. Uh, but in the future, uh, we, as we practice um, poetry and poetry analysis and writing about poetry, we'll have to go much, much deeper. So this is Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, this was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her sepulcher there by the sea and her tomb by the sounding sea. So that is Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, for those of you who do not know, a sepulcher is a type of uh, grave site. So typically they would be kind of built into things like cliff faces or big stone towers. And they would, the, the idea behind it was that um, it would prevent uh, grave robbers uh, for, from getting there easily. Um, because people used to be buried with valuables. Um, so women um, and men who had money would typically be buried with jewels and things like that, earthly possessions to take with them into the afterlife. And so Annabelle Lee, when she's described as high born, that would imply that she is a noble. Um, so she is somebody um, related to royalty or she is royalty herself. Um, and kinsman is a word that means family. So um, specifically family members. Uh, kin is family. Um, sixth grade, you may remember that being one of our vocabulary words um, from back in the fall. Kinsmen is literally just family members. Um, kind of an archaic word not used often these days. So the first thing I want us to do is just kind of quickly take a look at rhyme scheme. Um, anytime you look at a poem, um, you can generally tell pretty quickly um, if it rhymes. 
So let's take a look here. So it was many, many a year ago. That's our first sound. So we put an A there, right? So remember that in poetry, we annotate a rhyme scheme with A, B, C, D, all the way on through Z. If you have a poem that's that long, um, there are some. And if you actually manage to get all the way through the alphabet, you would write A, A or a double A and then B, B, C, C, all the way on down. Um, I haven't read a poem that's gone through the alphabet twice because um, I don't know if it's <laughs> realistic, um, but I'll have to see what the uh, longest rhyme scheme in poetry is because now I'm curious and I will make sure that once I find that answer out, I let you know in class. In the kingdom by the sea, that's going to be our B rhyme. Um, C and B, ha, they rhyme. Hilarious. Um, that a maiden there lived whom you may know, a go, no. Sounds like that's another one of those A's. Let's get that in there. By the name of Annabel Lee. Lee, C, B. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a B to me too. And this maiden she lived with no other thought. Mm, thought's a new one. That's going to be a C there. Then to love and be loved by me. Me, Lee, C. That's a B. Let's get that in there. Okay, so then we move into our next stanza. Remember that blocks of text in poetry like this, this is not a paragraph. This is a stanza. And remember that it is stanza written out, S-T-A-N-Z-A. All right, so we have stanza one, two, three, four, five down here, and then all the way on down is six. So we have six stanzas and we're now into our second one. I was a child and she was a child. Doesn't rhyme with anything we've read so far. That's going to be a D there. C, we've seen C before. That's definitely still a B. Love, mm, nope, that's going to be an E. And then we have a B, Annabelle Lee, B. Heaven, A, B, C, D, E, up, oh, we're all the way down to F. Coveted her and me, that's going to be another B. Um, so interesting um, thing that we're starting to notice here um, is that we, every other line seems to be a B rhyming scheme so far. When I, remember, anytime you're looking at a poem, um, honestly, any piece of writing, you should really look to see where the patterns are coming from. And we have A, B, A, B, C, B, D, B, E, B, F, B. So, so far, all of our even numbered lines, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, all of our even numbered lines are Bs. So we definitely have a pattern um, emerging here. And, We'll see if the if the every other B line continues. Um, but right now we've had three Bs in each one. So each stanza has been six lines. So we've had line one, two, three, four, five, six. So remember you discuss poetry in terms of lines if we want to get even smaller than stanzas. Um, because technically this whole stanza, there's only one period, right? Only one period and it's all the way down here at the end. Technically, if you were to say the first sentence, you are talking about the entire stanza because let's see, we have a comma here. That doesn't end a sentence. We have a comma here, doesn't end a sentence. No punctuation here. That's a semicolon, no punctuation. There's the period. So the whole stanza is a sentence and it's just broken up and structured differently to create um, a rhyming scheme. And so be careful when referring to lines and sentences in poetry. Uh, look for periods. Some poetry doesn't have any end line punctuation at all. Some does. Um, poetry is one of the things in English where you kind of get to bend and even basically break rules. Um, it's one of the things that makes poetry so interesting um, and so fun to read. So let's see, we have an ago, we have an ago, we're back to our A 
Do we have a B chilling? Do we have any INGs up in here? No. So A, B, C, D, E, F, and G is our next one. Then we have another B, because we know Lee is B. Came, do we have anything aim, aim, aim? Nope, no aim sounds. So we are now up to H. And then we have a B. Sepulcher is a really interesting word in that I don't know of anything that rhymes with sepulcher other than maybe the color ochre, um, which is kind of an orangey color. So that is definitely going to be our I there. So at this point, we definitely have a pattern emerging. And it is that every even line so far is a B sound. Now, another thing you might also notice too is that the, the B sounds are also actually slightly indented. So we have A, B, A, or yeah, A, B, C, B. See that? Okay, so that we can use that as a clue when we're reading um, to kind of help us keep track of where we are and what we're talking about. So let's see, did we use heaven anywhere else in this poem? Yes, we did. Heaven and heaven, it's, a, it's the same sound, right? Same word even. So that's gonna be our F again. Um, remember they were going by sounds. So the V sound, heaven, N, N. So we have that up here. Here it is again. It's got to be an F. Anytime you have an identical word, they're going to be the same sound, guys. Um, unless the poet does something special um, to alter the, uh, the sound of the word. So like, if you actually look very closely here, um, do you see that little spot right here? Um, that little accent mark above the E? It's probably a little hard to see. Let me bring that a little bit closer up here to the camera. There it is. Winged serifs. By putting that accent there, he makes it winged as opposed to winged, as we would say in more modern English. Um, so unless something like that happens um, to a word, uh, there really isn't going to be that much variation. Um, so then we have our B, no, a go, hey, there we go. That's another A sound. Then we have another C. And by C, I mean the word C, not the letter. Um, night, do we have any hard T sounds? Nope. So H, I, J, and then we have another B. Okay. Still keeping with our pattern. Okay. And then we have love. Do we have of? Of, v, v. we had love earlier, so we have another E again. We is definitely a B. Oh, wait a second. We had two E's. Okay. So notice how he's had a rhyme scheme all the way through, and then he technically has what you would consider to be a rhyming couplet. Um, technically speaking, we and we do rhyme. Um, it's kind of a interesting choice um, in terms of rhyme scheme, but they do rhyme. Above, love, that's another E. And then we have C, which is B. Soul, ooh, ooh. do we have any old sounds? I don't see any, I don't think you do either. So that's gonna be where our K is gonna come in. And then we have another B. So we have E, B, B, E, B, K, B. So we have broken scheme here. Um, and so it's interesting to note that we, we have this was many, many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. So here how there's that kind of sing songy music, musical quality to it. Now listen to stanza five. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who are older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. See how it kind of sounds different? Um, we've gone from that musical kind of happy um, uh, cadence to it's a little bit more somber. It's not, it's not quite as sing-songy and cute. Um, and 
the interesting thing, thing to think about is why did this happen? Why did why would Poe change the rhyme scheme? What is he trying to call attention to? Well, let's read stanza four and let's let's kind of dig in there and see if we can figure out what it is that made this change happen. The angels, not half so happy in heaven when envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. Huh. There it is. Check this out. So we've got chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee right there, that line I just underlined. This is where it changes, right? We've gone from, it was many, many a year ago, they lived there, they loved each other. They were, they were children, they were young. Um, in this kingdom by the sea, they loved each other. Um, their love was so great that the angels coveted them. Coveted, remember, means to envy. Um, or to desire what somebody else has. And then again, it was this reason that long, long ago in this kingdom by the sea. And so everything else is kind of here, right? And then we actually get to, and like we're talking about a wind coming out and they shut her up in a sepulcher. Remember a sepulcher is a tomb. So we go, hmm, that's probably not good. But Poe also hasn't straight up told us she's dead yet. Then we get here into four and then he's like kind of arguing with himself, right? He's basically saying it's because the angels were mad at us because our love was so amazing that they killed Annabelle Lee. They killed this woman that I love. And so at this point, Poe is basically kind of coming to this conclusion that, um, or I should say our narrator. Poe is saying that our narrator in here has come to the conclusion um, that Annabelle Lee um, was killed because the narrator and Annabelle Lee had such a great relationship and they were envious and jealous so they said nope this can't continue to exist and they sent a cold wind um, to kill her there was a lot of belief many many years ago that um, if you quote unquote caught a chill um, or got sick um, that it was because of cold weather not necessarily true as we know today um, however, that was what they believed at the time, because oftentimes when you do get sick, you get, you know, chilly, your body doesn't regulate temperature well. And so you get that, that those chills feeling and they, they believed because science wasn't great back then that, you know, that was what happened is you caught the chill from the wind and it would basically like freeze you to death. Um, but of course, you know, we know better now. So one of the other things I want to point out really quickly is that ever dissever, ever dissever, that is what is called an internal rhyme. So what that means is that there's a, a rhyme within a line um, where rather than normally what we have when we have our A and B here, A, B, A, B, that's called an end rhyme because the rhyme occurs at the end of the line. Makes sense. Whereas ever dissever is a rhyme with in the line so it's an internal rhyme it's inside for the moon never beams without bringing me dreams there we go there's another internal rhyme and then mm's. we don't have we don't have any of those sounds so that's going to be our l we have annabelle lee again so lee is a b eyes do we have eyes no, it's going to be our M. Now, again, we're annotating the end rhyme here um, at the end, but we, again, have another internal rhyme. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes. So, and so all the night tide, I lie down by the side. Hey, it's another one of those internal rhymes again. Um, and at this point, um, do we have, let's look back through really quickly and just check um, for our rhyme one more time, just to make sure we didn't miss, right? We always wanna look and see if side was up here. And no, it is not. So we're gonna have an N of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, bride side, N in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. And that's gonna be a B and a B. So um, when you have two lines, one right over top of each other, like this, you have the N and the N and a B and a B. Those are called couplets. So basically if we were to 
take all of this out, right? And let's focus only on the ends here. Um, whoops, you can't see that. And so all the nights hide out of that down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life, my bride. That is a couplet. And basically what that means is it is two, just two um, lines that rhyme together, a couple. Um, and then we have in the bottom here, in her tomb there in the in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. And again, it's kind of an, it, not different words, but the final sound is still the same. Um, and we have, again, another couplet. We actually have a couplet of couplets, if you will. Um, so I think what's so interesting about this last stanza here, and what makes this so final, is we have internal rhyme, B, internal rhyme, B, internal rhyme, which is a new sound here. And then it's part of a couplet, right? Then we have another couplet and it almost sounds final. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Right, we go from this musical internal rhyme Annabelle Lee, Annabelle Lee, C, C, side, bride. We, we change um, the scheme here. And the question becomes, what do we think of that? And so if I were to ask you a question um, is why do you think, what do you think Poe's purpose would have been in changing the rhyme scheme um, of the poem? Or why do you think Poe had the rhyme scheme that he does here in the final stanza? And what I think um, is, and the way this kind of makes me feel is that there's almost kind of a sadness to it, right? Um, especially there at the end where we go from this musical moon never beams without bringing me dreams, stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes. We have this beautiful musical quality and then we get to in her sepulcher there by the sea in her tomb by the sounding sea. Yeah, it rhymes, but those lines are shorter. They're not that musical. And I think there's kind of this finality to it, right? This is almost like a send off here. Uh, this is kind of our narrator snapping kind of back to his reality here. Uh, you know, all of these beautiful things up here and then it just kind of starts to get more and more serious. And then we have this change in these last two stanzas. It was our narrator comes to grips with the fact that the woman he loves is not alive anymore, uh, which you know is a challenging thing to kind of accept and to come to terms with. And I think that here, the the finality of our last two lines really kind of helps drive that home. And so the only other thing I want to talk about today. Uh, because I actually made a mistake earlier and we need to correct that is um, we need to talk about the poet versus the narrator. Um, so I actually made a mistake earlier and I was referring to the speaker um, in the poem as Poe and that is actually incorrect. Um, so could he be our narrator? Sure, but we don't know that for sure. Um, in this case, um, that's a possibility. But realistically, we have no reason based on what we've read in here um, to believe that these are all real events that happened to Edgar Allan Poe. So the poet is, of course, the person who wrote the story or the poem, right? Kind of like an author writes a book a poet writes his poem and or her. And so the poet writes the poem and the narrator is whoever is speaking in here. They don't have to be the same person. Um, in some poetry, they are. Um, and in some poetry, they are completely different people. Um, I think it makes sense for us to say that this probably wasn't um, something that actually happened to Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Edgar Allan Poe was a American poet living in the colonies and he, uh, he very likely didn't have, um, anybody he loved or knew, um, 
get clo- sealed away in a big tomb in the side of a cliff face. These were mostly a uh, European um, construct. Uh, there aren't really many like sepulchers in the colonies. Um, they just weren't that much of a thing. Most of royalty uh, would have stayed in Europe because you know Europe was a pretty great place. And if you're already rich and living the good life, why would you need to go to the colonies? So it, it makes sense for us to say mm, Poe and the narrator are probably not the same person. Um, the other thing is that in the very end here, um, he says, um, so all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride and her sepulcher there by the sea and her tomb by the sounding sea. This guy implies that he's just sitting here with his, his dead wife. Um, and I don't think um, that somebody is actually going to, in reality, spend a lot of time in a crypt um, or a tomb or a grave, just like every night, just being there. Um, so because I feel like that's kind of an unrealistic thing for somebody to do in real life, I can say, hmm, I'm going to use this as evidence that Poe and the narrator are probably not the same person. Um, the other thing too, is that um, when he refers to highborn kinsmen, he's probably referring to nobility. There really wasn't much of that in the American colonies where Poe lived. And I can say, because Poe refers to highborn kinsmen, um, we can believe that the poem was set in another time in another place. Um, and we can use what Poe has said here um, and what he has written to kind of give us an idea of when, where, and kind of piece together some of these differences. And because we've kind of started to pull that together, right, we've been able to basically construct an argument and say that based on the fact that Poe refers to highborn kinsmen in stanza three, and he also, and the um, narrator lays down with his wife in the sepulcher and sepulchers are a European um, construct for the most part. Um, we can say that Poe and the narrator are likely not the same person. Um, so we, when we say based on, we're basically saying we, we read this in the text, right? And we have said that um, we are dealing with um, we're based, based on the highborn kinsman part, we're saying that this probably separates it from the American colonies. And then we can also refer back to the many, many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea. Um, there are no kingdoms in the United States. So we can say that we're, given the highborn kinsman and the addition of the many, many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea, that the narrator and Poe are not the same person because if Poe were actually the one speaking, there would be more references to America at this point as opposed to a kingdom. Um, and we can presume or make the inference that this is probably a European kingdom, most likely, um, as there were quite a few coastal um, kingdoms and castle towns in um, the British Isles and uh, surrounding countries. So we're basically using what is here to make an inference, right? We don't know for sure that this is or isn't Poe. Uh, but based on the evidence we were able to pull out of the text, we, we were able to say that um, Poe is not the narrator. Um, and when and an inference, remember, is just essentially a educated guess using evidence that we got from the text. Um, so that's pretty much all we're going to do with this poem for today. Um, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I'm looking forward to us getting back into the classroom um, nice and safely and uh, 
getting into a little bit more poetry, a little bit more reading, a little bit more writing. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, otherwise, you have a safe and wonderful day. Maybe build a snowman. Um, just be careful. It did ice a little bit last night. Have a wonderful day, explorers, and I hope to see you back in the classroom tomorrow.